Hey, welcome to Speechless. We're glad to have you here live Thursday night from the SCC studios in White Bear Lake. Also live um, from SPNN in St. Paul. And folks, if you're a parent, if you're a grandparent, if you have children, you're an aunt and uncle with children, it, uh, you need to watch this show. And, and if you're a wannabe parent, or even if you're a child in school, you need to watch this show because you're going to get information you need to know in order how to survive the upcoming onslaught or what's happening to the destruction of the family, who's trying to tear it down, what's taking place, and just an overriding of you as a parent and what your rights are and how you want to raise your kids. And so I will be having Michelle Lance with Child Protection League Action on to the show today where we will be discussing um, what their organiza organization does and what is taking place right now in the state of Minnesota uh, with athletics and with other aspects of relating to child protection. And just a little insight before we go, they got a lot of attention by running this advertisement here that says a male wants to shower, i got to get it right here, uh, with your 14-year-old daughter. Okay, yeah, I don't know if you saw these, ad these advertisements, but that got a lot of attention to what was going on in Minnesota and brought a lot of attention to the transgender policy that the Minnesota State High School League was developing. So we're going to talk about that, what's taking place and what's, what's looking down the road. Uh, but before we get into that, I'm going to talk about two issues. Uh, first, cameras in the courtroom. That was my last week's show, and I showed the U.S. House of Representatives Judicial Committee uh, on the uh, talking about whether there should be cameras in federal courtroom. There's a, specifically talking about a certain bill that related to that, and they're trying to expand the use of cameras in the courtroom. Of course, my position is, yes, it has to be for transparency, and to protect and to pr provide a fair trial for somebody being accused of a crime or any civil action for that matter. Because if that transparency isn't there, if people don't get to see what's going on, how can that be a fair trial? And our Constitution says a trial must be public. And does that mean not being able to show it to as many people? people as can, be, as can be seen as those that want to get it out? Or does that mean limit it to the only number of people that can, a limited number of people that can be in the courtroom where it has to be filtered by the press? I don't want it to be filtered by the press. I want you to be able to see what's going on in that courtroom. And so did the people who wrote our Constitution. Um, so I showed that show, and then someone brought to my attention this last Saturday that there is actually going to be a hearing in the Minnesota uh, Justice Center, which is the first building to the east of the state capitol, that's where the appellate court meets, that's where the Supreme Court meets, they're going to have a hearing on cameras in the courtroom. That's going to be December 16th at 2 p.m. I believe it was in courtroom 200, it may be 300, it may be a totally different, but if you go to the building and ask where's the cameras in the courtroom meeting, um, uh, they'll tell you where it is. And, you know, I, I'm going to show up and film. Now, with reason, there needs to be some guidelines for cameras in the courtroom. And the court needs to know who's coming, and they can't have 500 people fit into those courtrooms with cameras uh, or the press. So having an orderly process is reasonable. The main issue is will the information that's going on in the courtroom get out. And if they establish a way that that happens, that's great. That's not the intent of what's going to take place in this meeting. But see, this is a public hearing. This is not a courtroom. And that's a big difference in their mind, because if it was a courtroom, then they would restrict who can film and who couldn't, and, um, or whether it would be open or not. But it, since it's a public hearing, and I started this practice out boy, a number of years when I started finding out, uh, say, eight years ago, uh, about what was going on in the courtrooms, um, the court would have these hearings. And then I showed up with a camera, and all the court people were, what, what do we do? There's somebody here with a camera that's actually going to film judicial policy making of the judicial branch of government in Minnesota. And they didn't know what to do, the administrators. And 
Paul Anderson, Supreme Court Justice, walks in and goes, a camera, it's about time. These are public hearings. Great, great, We're glad to have you here. He was really glad until, <laughs> until all the uh, negative comments about the judiciary <laughs> came out. Um, but you see, that's, that's why we have public hearings. So people, and that's why we have cameras in the courtroom and, and in policy matters, because people then know what's going on and there can't be this wall that separates in the, so people can't see the reality that's taking place in the courtroom. So anyway, December 16th, 2 p.m., I hope to be down there filming it so I can get you uh, snippets of what's taking place there. Um, so it's a big issue, but believe me, right now, the court is not in any way looking to expand cameras in the courtroom. They really don't want to do that, uh, and it's too bad. Uh, so uh, that's coming up this week. Now, the other issue, uh, Maplewood had a workshop on domestic violence, um, about a half hour's worth, where Ramsey County Attorney uh, Choi came in and made a presentation along with the Tubman Institute about a mutual agreement between the county and the city working statistics on um, how to figure out the statistics and how to really try to help end domestic violence. And one thing that I spoke of before that I played on her show with some of these, with the, some of these clips, that they actually set a policy that was sex neutral. The policy didn't just say women and children. It just said domestic violence. But when Chief Snell got up to talk, it was all about women and children. And I made a distinction when I talked before the city council and visitors presentation, because I'm not allowed to speak during these other presentations, um, that I was glad that it was sex neutral. And uh, so that men can be brought into this study too. Well, in this workshop that came up this last Monday, County Attorney Choi was talking, and guess what? Everything was about women and children let alone the number one abusers of children are women, uh, let alone that women abuse just as much as men do. These are all the statistics that are coming out from doctoral educated uh, researchers that are women. And so how can we really deal with domestic violence if we don't look at the whole formula that's taking place there? And, and we can't. So. Um, I am going to break down that film, and, and so somehow the message got out because the Tubman Institute and uh, Attorney General, uh, not Attorney General, County Attorney Choi, uh, would, would, they would not mention violence against men, and that's too bad. So, you know, that's the way it goes, but I will break down that video, we'll do a whole show on that. and. Uh, the statistics are out there, so why are we going to double the effort? And the other thing on domestic violence is if you establish a policy that automatically arrests a man on the accusation of domestic violence, no matter what the exculpatory evidence that shows that it didn't take place, uh, but when a man accuses a woman of violence, that one, there's no automatic arrest, um, you're going to have skewed statistics. And I talked to County Attorney Choi very briefly. Uh, it was kind of passing in the hallways here at the studios a, a while back. And he was a little baffled by that because all of his statistics say that men initiate domestic violence more than women. Um, and their statistics would be that way because they won't listen to a man saying, hey, I got beat up here. And so it doesn't get put into the equation. So th that's, a, that's a problem, but that's what has to be made known. If you're going to have a study, make it fair, make it even, make it accurate. And instead of putting in that study the biases from the beginning. Uh, and then I think they'll end up seeing what the over 230 studies that have been done by doctoral educated people, uh, half of them women, <laughs> say that women abuse just as men, much as men do, so, um, and just as violently. So anyway, that's, uh, that's, that will be coming up on future shows. But today, I am glad to have Michelle Lentz with 
Child Protection League action here. And you've been really making the rounds in the news, That's right. uh, causing a whirlwind of uh, what some people would say is controversy, but you're not the one causing the controversy. You're just getting information out about what's taking place in our Minnesota uh, high school uh, athletics associations. And, but you actually existed, um, Child Protection League Action actually existed mm -hmm. before this whole issue got brought up. That's so right. who are you? Who are you guys? What, what are you about? We are uh, an organization that that has basically three elements. The Minnesota Child Protection League is our research and educational arm. We're a 501c3. We um, took in 2014, uh, we undertook a, a our, our first major project was to uh, educate the public about the bullying bill that was going through the legislature okay. last year. So we, in order to, um, in order to do town halls and uh, work down at the Capitol, we formed uh, Child Protection League Action, which is a 501c4 okay. or grassroots organizing. Um, organization and then we also formed CPL PAC which is our poli our political action committee which allowed us to then um, after the after the the legislature and the bullying bill passed then hold some of those uh, house members who voted for that bill accountable and you know we were pleased that we were able to help influence the election and and the the members that we targeted for taking that bad vote in the end lost their seat mm -hmm. and so um, so we were kind of a full service organization in that regard but our main purpose is to protect children from exploitation indoctrination and violence and we do that through education through mobilizing parents to um, get the facts, to be able to sort through what's being said in the media or, or by uh, politicians and bureaucrats and get to the heart of the matter and then take action to protect their kids. Well, I, I find fascinating the process that you went through. You started with one organization and then you realized you had to go to another to be effective and then you had to go to another to be really uh, effective also. Mm. Uh, I mean, it's just, I see that natural progression with a lot of uh, organizations and, and I mean, you guys really are powerful, uh, in my opinion. You, you have a voice and it has been effective um, and got your message out. And the anti-bullying bill was the, the first start. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the groups is down at the legislature, is that the 501c4? Um, Pretty that, much, uh, most of our our lobbying and our grassroots organizing is done under the umbrella of of the five hundred one c four. So yeah, yeah, and so when did you actually start? Uh, twenty thirteen, spring of twenty thirteen, I believe. Okay, so real well, I we're wow. relatively young. Mm -hmm. Yes, you are, mm -hmm. uh, and for how young you are. Uh, you've had a lot of effect. I, I, I just can guarantee you that. I mean, I've, I've seen you down at the Capitol um, and test with, with your people testifying mm -hmm. and doing an excellent job being very professional uh, in that process. So what, what's your involvement in, in I'm the this. state coordinator for CPL Action, okay. and so I basically am the public spokesperson for the organization, uh, do a, a number of, of things. We're a, a small organization. We rely on donations. Mm -hmm. We are a, mainly a volunteer organization, and um, we have uh, incredible board of directors and supporters who are talented and dedicated, and I couldn't do what I'm doing without the help of them. Mm -hmm. So I'll do whatever it takes because I have children, you have children, right. and, the, and what has made us so um, effective is that we focus on that aspect of public policy and education. Mm -hmm. How do these policies, how do, do, does a potential piece of legislation, how does it affect our kids? Right. And, and so we look through that lens and we work um, with that aim in mind. 
How do we protect our kids? Well, that's something that a lot of parents identify with. And so we've been able to get right to the heart with them because we're talking to them about the threats that are coming at their children. I, I find that an interesting um, contrast to a teacher's union because they do say they care about the kids, yet when it comes down to a lot, and I'm not going to have you say what you think about the teachers union but this is me thinking the teachers union is really about the teachers and about what happens to kids isn't that big of a thing uh, in there but that this is why I see you as so valuable because let's see you're not worried about your salaries mm -hmm. you know uh, you're not worried about I mean this is truly just about the children mm -hmm. and the exploitation that may be going on with them because there is money out to be made for exploiting children mm -hmm. So you kind of started, well, we got a phone call here already. So uh, let's, call. do you have a comment or a question? Uh, qu question for, for Michelle. Okay. See, before you get too, too far into this transgender issue that I know you're going to talk about, the, uh, what I would like her to talk about for a minute is what was wrong with the bullying bill. I mean, you put it out there, but a lot of people probably haven't followed that issue and just accept it as, as a, you know, this, all that sounds good. So what, what's wrong with it? And uh, then your, your comment, uh, Mr. Kinley, about uh, the teachers, I would say that it's, it's what comes down from the top. What these superintendents like Valeria Silva or over in Minneapolis there, that that the, and these school boards, these uh, liberal school boards, that take and push their agenda down into the classroom and force the teachers to uh, disseminate things that the teachers themselves find appalling and, and totally disagree with and know it's, it's harmful to the children, but their jobs are on the line. But, uh, yes, let's, let's hear a little comment about the bullying bill. Okay. Please. Uh, so I got that question here, but there's a, just two more things before we get to that question, caller, uh, that I want to just kind of get into because you, you have dealt with, your organization has dealt with sex trafficking, right? Mm -hmm. That's part of mm -hmm. one of the reasons you got started too. So mm -hmm. what, what kind of is your involvement with that? Well, stopping the, sex trafficking. Right. The, the, the reality of the sex trafficking industry is that it, um, it affects younger and younger um, both both males and females mm -hmm. and it, when you when you look at some of the statistics <clears throat> regarding sex trafficking it, it's like you have a pipeline and on the end of the pipeline is the sex trafficking industry it's tied to pornography it's tied to um, other addictions it's tied to organized crime and the the kids in, inevitably get sucked into this. And so um, younger and younger age, I think the, the youngest um, age of, of a, a child involved in sex trafficking is like 11 and 12 years old. So when people think of sex trafficking, they think prostitution or, or uh, adult right. women mainly, but that's not the reality. Hmm. And it, it, um, Minnesota ranks pretty high in the nation in sex trafficking. So it's an issue um, that, that, is, that pertains to us and our children. Mm -hmm. And the, the risk factors, um, the, 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 um, what, the way that the sex trafficking industry and, and predators target young women on campuses, it's called the Romeo effect. They kind of win them over and then they, they suck them in and then they get raped and I mean, there's a whole process to all of this, and there's a grooming process that is part of what predators use to lure women and, and boys, too, into sex trafficking. That grooming process is targeted at young kids. Is that happening in the schools or just outside the schools or both? Or, or where, I mean, <coughs> is, is it mostly older kids in their 20s that are targeting these teens? Or, and is it, I mean, if an 11-year-old is being targeted, they're more than likely in a public school. So that's going to affect s kids at a public school. Let me share a little bit of the, yeah. the research. The research that, that we have looked at shows that 
when children are exposed to sexually explicit material, mm -hmm. it causes changes in the brain. Mm -hmm. There is some testimony um, at the congressional level by, by members of the FBI mm -hmm. that show uh, material that the FBI uses to um, determine uh, uh, the, the their investigation of pedophilia. Mm -hmm. And the material that the criteria that they use to determine if a pedophile is is trying to groom a young person mm -hmm. looks very similar, I hate to say it, mm. to some of the material that is used in our public school. Okay. Okay, so what are we doing as as public institutions, if we are exposing children to sexually explicit material, mm -hmm. which we have evidence that shows has an effect on their brain mm -hmm. and is used by pedophiles to, to groom children. Mm -hmm. And um, on the, what happens on the other end, when kids are exposed, not just in our culture, because the, right. clearly this is re right. prevalent in our culture, but also within our school system is that um, the, through that grooming process, Normalization we end up too, yeah. right. We end up with both victims and predators. Mm -hmm. Another statistic that sort of bears this out is that 44 percent of convicted rapists are under the age of 25. And mm. so it's not just that that children are being groomed to um, to be victims, mm -hmm. but that by exposing children to sexually explicit material, even if it's in the name of education or, right. you know, don't, I hope not to get ranting about that bullying bill, but that was a component of the bullying bill, wow. was teaching, encouraging schools to teach in the name of prevention of bullying mm -hmm. and understanding of human sexuality mm -hmm. in every subject, every grade. Mm -hmm. And we started out by saying, what does this have to do with bullying? But that was part of the, that became part of the law. Okay, wow. Uh, so you're, you're, you're educating people about what's happening in the sex traffic industry and how it is. Um, We're focusing a little bit more on, the, on the, this end. If you, if you look at the pipeline and on, and the, on the other end is mm -hmm. we have a sex trafficking problem. What are we doing that is... Uh, creating victims and predators. And so right. our organization, both focusing on how can parents protect their children? Okay. Um, you know, I mean, from things like the, the, the reality that even at places like malls, mm -hmm. you know, they have to be aware. Mm -hmm. um, so on our website, there's a number of educational videos that, that talk about that. Okay. Well, it looks like I'm going to have to have you on for another show just dealing with that issue yeah. because that's a, that's a big issue. Uh, and that if we can get it here, then people have a place to see right. uh, what's going on. So uh, also you've done some work with the United Nations. We or? just did a little bit of advisory work with a, a non-governmental organization, they're called an NGO, that, that asked us to help with a resolution that they were looking at that was being taken up by the United Nations. And so it was because of our work on the bullying bill and um, our, our research and education, that is, is a movement nationwide, by the way, the, mm -hmm. this anti-bullying movement is not peculiar to Minnesota. Okay. And um, there was a resolution being taken up at the United Nations. I guess apparently bullying is a global problem. <laughs> and so th <laughs> we were asked yeah. to, to advise on some of that and we were happy to help and assist um, that NGO with some of their research. So all of it focuses on policies that affect children mm -hmm. and and when they are potentially harmful, what can we do to protect them, our kids, and what can we do to stop those policies that are potentially harmful? Okay, um, an another whole issue. Now we got another phone caller, so what I'm, what I'm gonna try to do here is uh, uh, we still got that question hanging out there. So we got this motion, uh, what was wrong with uh, the bullying bill? Uh, so that motion's still out there, but it looks like we got a caller that uh, has got an amendment to the motion, an amendment to the question. Who knows? Uh, caller, do you have a comment or question? Well, I, I've got a comment. I was at the Republican convention here uh, last <laughs> spring, uh -huh. and Representative uh, Kathy Lomer brought the book from Common Core. She yeah. was almost afraid to bring it into the 
into the convention to show the people what they're teaching you in school because she considered, considered it borderline pornographic. Mm -hmm. And actually, as it was passed around, the people were disgusted. And yet I see more and more things that on the Internet on what they're teaching them with mirrors and kids bending over and how to uh, play with themselves and stuff. I don't think that belongs in our school system. All right. Any comments on that? I'm familiar with the book that, yeah, that the it, caller yeah. is referring to, and that book, the at last count that we had, was in 27 schools um, in the Twin Cities. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it was, on the cover of the book, it says that it's appropriate for 10 and older, and the pictures in that book are similar to the kinds of pictures that the FBI testified congressionally mm -hmm. um, are what pedophiles use to groom children. Mm -hmm. The bottom line is they are highly inappropriate mm -hmm. for children, and the the pro the the overarching problem is this hypersexualization of children at a time when mentally they do not have the maturity to handle those kinds of ideas, pictures, themes, right. and stories, mm -hmm. and and that's where. That, that is just settled science. I mean, that yeah. is not disputable. The developing mind of a child is not the frontal lobe. Risk-taking, mm -hmm. self-control is right. not uh, fully developed until well into the 20s. And yet, at the age of 10, apparently mm -hmm. some in our school systems think those were appropriate pictures. It wasn't a curriculum of itself. It was a supplemental book, but, but the, I can give you a number of other uh, curriculums that include these kinds of, okay. of things. Yeah, it's not just that curriculum. No. Uh, and I remember when Representative Goonhaken was speaking on the House floor, I was mm -hmm. watching the TV, and he handed the book out. And, uh, uh, you know, it was embarrassing to a lot of the people that were voting for the anti-bullying bill. And um, uh, as it was described, is if I handed that to a child, I'd be arrested. Uh, right. Uh, that's the type of stuff that's going on, but we legalize it in into our public school. Uh, so let's get back to our other caller's question here. What what was wrong with the anti-bullying bill? What was well, let me about? see if I can remember going <laughs> okay. back to to last uh, legislative session. Uh -huh. It was called the Safe and Supportive Minnesota Schools Act. Nothing could be further from the truth. Under that bill, which it kind of morphed and changed as, as it went through the legislature as well, the, there was no requirement that parents be notified if their child was being bullied, was a bystander, was doing the bullying, and yet the school was given the, uh, the authority to put that child through a, a remediation, re-education, which re-education might require them to be exposed to things that parents would object to, such mm -hmm. as um, uh, material that is, that is offensive or, or not age-appropriate. There was no requirement that parents be notified. Hmm. And so that was the one of the first things that just outraged parents. If my kid is being bullied in school, I have a right to know. Yeah, absolutely. Right. The second is the um, lack of local control, that there was this top-down approach from the state of Minnesota saying all of you school districts will, you can, you can design your own policy as long as that policy has all of this criteria, then, um, then you're good to go. And so they, they created this policy. They put, created a new agency within the Department of Education to, now it's called to assist them, but, but essentially the commissioner at the Department of Education has the, the right to investigate and make sure that these schools have these policies. And then the most egregious of all was in the name of the prevention of bullying to encourage these schools to expose children. The, the reading of the law said that the schools were encouraged to teach an understanding of human sexuality in okay. essentially every grade, every subject. So what that meant was that a, a child in math now would, I don't know, first grade, second grade, where do they learn uh, this kind of basic math, might, might say, Susie and her two dads 
went to the store to buy pasta and you know they bought four boxes at 75 mm -hmm. cents how much did they did they spend the in science they would have to teach that francis bacon was the father of the scientific model and francis bacon was a homosexual the the pushing hmm. schools that they must include these kinds of things in their in their subjects as a mm -hmm. way of preventing bullying and to teach an understanding of human sexuality as a way of preventing bullying was just too much for parents. But isn't that kind of a, a reverse type of bullying? We don't care about your values as a parent or what values you want as a parent to instill in your children. We're going to counteract that anyway and too bad. It's a complete undermining of parental authority and the rights of parents to raise their children according to their values. Now, you know, we should, we should make this, this is the obvious thing. Nobody's for bullying. Right. We all want kids to be treated with respect and, and dignity mm -hmm. and for schools to be a place where, where that dignity and that respect is upheld. Mm -hmm. But you can't legislate this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And the fact that um, bullying is, you know, we're seeing story after story uh, across the country, uh, schools that have a comprehensive anti-bullying policy and yet they still have bullying problems. It was never meant really to stop bullying. It's a, it's a, a popular theme that the average person can't possibly be opposed to, but behind it mm -hmm. is a social engineering um, experiment. That is, right. that is fostered on our schools and on our children. And when we exposed that, parents got it. And they got the fact that their kids were not safe with these kinds of policies mm -hmm. being put in place. Right. Schools have a right to have an anti-bullying policy. They should have an anti-bullying policy if they have you know, bullying problems in their schools that should be handled at the local level. Mm -hmm. Parents have a right to know. Mm -hmm. And um, this comprehensive uh, educational reform component of it that it would bring in um, curriculum and, and ideas and stories and themes mm -hmm. that of a sexual nature have no place in that kind of a policy. Well, yeah, uh, I see a couple other things on top of that. When you started talking about us coming from the top down, and of course, a lot of the curriculum that's designed for schools now, whether it's No Child Left Behind, uh, you could probably name a couple of the other ones that were out there, but the whole idea was to have a federal curriculum. Mm -hmm. And that's not the way our country's designed. We're, we're a, a bottom up, it's from the people on up, and here with Common Core now, it's all mm -hmm. designed, this time though, not through the government, mm -hmm. but through corporations. Corporations are going to fund this common core, so the government says, we're not doing this. It's a corporation that came to us. But the corporation is trying to take over the whole education system, so it's this top-down, we're going to tell you what to teach your kids, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I mean, I see this as part of it, uh, but the key thing that I think, not only with the unconstitutional process of top-down, is the lack of uh, freedom of association. I am, as a parent, forced to put my kids and teach my kids things. I can't have my kids learn in a free association mm -hmm. scenario. Um, mm -hmm. I, that's where I see a lot of the, you know, and of course you have to get rid of freedom of association. You have to get rid of grassroots in order to have uh, uh, this elite system coming yeah. from the top down. The reality, I, I suppose my last point on the on the bullying bill that that we helped people to understand is that this was not a locally developed prop, uh, policy. Mm -hmm. This policy looked a, an awful lot like the 60-page um, consent decree that Anoka Hennepin School District signed with the U.S. Department of Justice after they were sued. Mm -hmm. It looked a lot like the, the law that was passed in Illinois, mm -hmm. the law that was passed in several other right. states. I mean, this is a, this is, it looked a lot like the the 11 point requirement or guidance that was coming from the U.S. Department of Education and the governor's task force that um, was the preliminary step to the, the bullying mm -hmm. bill in Minnesota. If you look at what documents did they look at 
right you know they they in the end recommended a bullying policy that matched all of the the criteria of the US Department of Education so mm -hmm. we know that that this was coming down right from the top mm -hmm. and parents have greater and citizens and taxpayers when things are handled at the state level and the local level, you have much more influence right. than when they're, they're, they're shoved down right. from the federal government. And um, it was completely unfair to, the, to Minnesota taxpayers mm -hmm. to um, tell them that this was a locally developed policy that looked mm -hmm. a lot like every other policy right. being pushed across the country. <laughs> well, I mean, that's, that's what they all are. And there's a reason. It's the same people. They just changed the name. Mm -hmm. they, I mean, they okay, that didn't work. People now recognize Common Core. They recognize uh, No Child Left Behind or Race to the Top. Mm -hmm. That name's recognized. That didn't work. Let's just change the name, move yeah. little pieces around. It's Eternal the same thing. Vigilance. I Eternal guess. Vigilance, yes. Mm -hmm. That's the price of liberty. Uh, absolutely. So did, did any changes get made to the anti-bullying bill? that passed the state legislature. In the end, that, that bill, all of the concerns that parents had that we voiced, they, they remain. You know, we're, we're monitoring the implementation of, mm -hmm. of that now law, and it takes time for these things to be rolled out. Right. And so it might look, look, nothing happened. Well, the sky didn't fall. It, it, these things are not um, transparent. They are, they are not rapid. They're incremental, and it requires parents and organizations like CPL Action to stay on top of them and watch how they're being implemented. And um, in the end, there's there's uh, serious concerns with that law. Mm -hmm. Now, I know you're uh, a young organization, uh, but uh, are you working with teachers? I think the caller mentioned you know, teachers are being forced. It's coming from the top down. They're being forced this curriculum where it used to be that teachers had a say in the classroom. Are you, how are teachers responding to this curriculum that you know of? Uh, let me give you my, my personal opinion about, about teachers. I think for the most part, they went to school because they care about kids. Right. They want to teach. They want right. to do the work that, that is behind their passion. Mm -hmm. And more and more, they are being required to engage in, in the social experiments in in teaching um, material that seems to go way beyond mm -hmm. reading, writing, and arithmetic. Mm -hmm. And I think that there, it hampers their ability to do what they were passionate about doing, mm -hmm. why they went into that mm -hmm. profession. Right. And so I, I think uh, the last I heard, there were 42 mandates on the local school districts from the either the state government only or the federal and the state mm -hmm. government these are these are mandates that make it more difficult for schools to control the way that they are run locally and you know just let teachers get back to the 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 thing that they love to do which is to engage in learning and and help kids mm -hmm. to learn we heard from a number of teachers who, mm -hmm. who they they're sick of it mm -hmm. and they're and they're hamstrung, you know, they right. are, the limitations are put on them. And that's the reality of our, of our school system. Right. Mm. Okay, so that brings us to then the um, transgender athletic policy mm -hmm. that the Minnesota State High School League, uh, as they call them, MSHLC, I believe, um, a a a SL, mm -hmm. uh, that they have now policy or is it a um, is it more than a policy or less or you know what but they're trying to push on to schools now mm -hmm. and um, of course you brought out this uh, ad here I'm going to show it again um, that hit the papers and created a lot of attention Emil wants to shower beside your 14 year old daughter uh, are you okay with that <laughs> that was the, the full page ad there and that got you a lot of attention, um, and rightly so. Uh, so wh what is this policy about? What was it originally about? Because I've heard through efforts it's been changed, but mm -hmm. how much has it really changed? So what was it originally about, and why were they pushing this transgender policy? The policy has always been about allowing 
uh, transgender students. So, for example, a boy who feels that he's a girl to play on the girls' athletic team. Mm -hmm. It's always been about that, and in the end, that's what it was about. That policy, um, it's actually a guideline. Mm -hmm. uh, if, you, if you look at the synopsis on the Minnesota State High School League, website of the meeting that they had last Thursday where they passed this, it says this is a guideline for the schools. Uh, okay. the, the president, although uh, Scott McCready, when he was speaking to NPR, I believe, mm -hmm. said that this, uh, the quote is, amounts to a mandated policy on the schools. Mm -hmm. um, there, there, from the, from the get-go, there were problems here. First of all, the process itself was not okay. transparent. The Minnesota State High School League did not take this most controversial issue and let the public know, we are taking this up, we need to hear from you. Our uh, CPL action decided that that's what needed to happen. And so we took the ad out in the paper in order to alert the public that this policy was coming up in September or the beginning of October for a vote. And the public didn't know. Well, how did you know? Well, we we had been because following you're just it. Paying attention. We yep, yeah, but it had been brought to our attention. We had been following it for some weeks, at least since August, I believe. And then it became apparent to us that this thing was going to come up for mm -hmm. a vote, and there was no time to um, educate. Uh, you know, no. a massive amount of people when this thing was coming up in, in a couple of weeks. The best way to do that was to take a full-page ad out in the Star Tribune, and we did, and, and that elevated this issue. I don't think they wanted it mm -hmm. to have public scrutiny. The, the organizations were, hmm. that we were speaking with right. were telling us they weren't invited to the table. They right. weren't involved in drafting the policy. And so in the end, we said, you know, hey, Minnesota, do you know this is taking place? Well, who, who wants public scrutiny? And, I mean, the people in the authority positions usually don't want public mm -hmm. scrutiny, especially if they want to do something they know the public isn't going to be mm -hmm. liking. Uh, so... Um, what were the the the, the bad? Well, would you describe would you describe this policy um, guideline, which really is a policy, as worse than the anti-bullying bill? About the same, or or you know, just another. I don't think it matters when when your kids are in danger. You know, there's danger yeah. there, and you know we should we should be clear that once again nobody mm -hmm. was nobody's for bullying. Right, and. Uh, everybody believes that transgender students have every right to play in high school athletics. Mm -hmm. The way it is in Minnesota prior to the passing of this, of this, uh, this guideline, the, uh, a, a boy can, a transgender student can play if they can make the team, but they play on their biological team, sure. their, uh, the team of their biological mm -hmm. sex. Same with a girl who, who is transgender. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's fair um, the way it is. And what this policy sought to do was to create the criteria by which a transgender student could play on the team of the opposite sex. That's the heart of the matter of okay. this policy, right? Mm -hmm. And um, the there were, at the beginning, all kinds of um, additional requirements on schools that would have been a mandated policy public schools, private schools, religious schools, even homeschooled students who participate in high school athletics mm -hmm. would come under the, the, um, the requirements of right. this policy. It had, it, the first draft even had requirements that, let's say you have a biological boy, mm -hmm. he's playing on the girls' team now, the girls are required to refer to him as a he or as a she or a her. I mean, that was in mm -hmm. the, original, the original draft. Hormone therapy was in the original draft. Mm -hmm. uh, you could not, uh, if, if that student chose to um, shower with the, the right. biological team, the, the girls team, that mm -hmm. you couldn't deny him that. Okay. Uh, traveling with that team. I mean, all of that was in the original policy. In and the, in and the isn't end, that happening in some places? Where, sure. Well, because um, I've heard of examples where it is happening. Uh, I don't remember all the details, but uh, 
boys have been going into the girls' locker room and right. changing their clothes. In the Minneapolis school district right now, there is a transgender policy that, that says that if a, um, a, a girl who is uh, transgender, so she is believes that she's a boy, she's allowed to use the boys' bathroom. A boy who believes he's a girl is allowed to use the girls' bathroom. And we had a parent come to us and, mm. and tell us uh, of a story of in Minneapolis schools of a, a girl who showed up in the, in a uh, fifth grade girl who showed up in the boys' bathroom with third grade boys. Hmm. And parents don't know about it. Once hmm. again, parents are kept out right. of the loop. They have a right to know. In other states, we're seeing similar. This is, once again, this is not unique to Minnesota. Mm -hmm. This is happening uh, in other states as well. And it is also coming down from the, uh, Office of Civil Rights, a mm -hmm. component of the U.S. Department of Education, the Department of Justice, and the Obama administ under this uh, this okay. administration. So, the there is all kinds of um, concerns: privacy, mm -hmm. safety, uh, the the and fairness. Mm -hmm. um, we have under Minnesota law, the schools are allowed to have boys teams and girls teams, and to have them separate is not. Uh, discrimination that's right. in our law right now right. title nine which is the u.s uh, civil rights code that mm -hmm. that pertains to women and having and equal opportunity and, and athletics and yep. yeah says equal that, out the sports <coughs> scholarships right. so women have just as many as the boys and right yeah. it was meant to serve an un, at the t uh, underserved right. um group which was women in, in mm -hmm. athletics mm -hmm. and so our the cpl action we obtained a a legal opinion from Liberty Council on the legal implications that this has with Title IX. Uh -huh. We obtained a letter from the American College of Pediatricians that addressed the the privacy and the the health and mm -hmm. the the safety concerns of exposing children to these kinds of things at a at, at in mm -hmm. middle school is wh which is where this would start. And sadly, the Minnesota State High School League seemed to turn a deaf ear to all of those um, very expert and, and uh, professional opinions and passed this policy, or it, it's technically a guideline. They, they want schools to think this is a policy, yeah. but it's not. It's a guideline, yeah. and schools should reject it. Well, we'll get into that guideline versus policy in a second, but what I want to... Uh, uh, well, we got a caller on the line. That's what I wanted to go to, and then we'll get to that issue. So, caller, do you have a comment or a question? Well, I have a comment, and I and I guess that um, uh, I'm very simplistic, um, not even simple-minded, <laughs> I guess you could say. But I okay. back in my day, and as you can tell, I'm older. Um, I couldn't tell. I think that um, the decision on who you shower with and who you uh, are in more intimate contact with goes by your birth certificate. If it says on your birth certificate you're a girl, then I guess that's where you shower. If it says you're a boy, then you shower with the boys. And if each of those creates a problem because you don't feel like one or the other, then that's a separate problem that um, counselors or somebody else uh, knowledgeable can deal with, but it is absolutely not right to uh, enforce a right, uh, what they consider a right, uh, and take away someone else's right um, to the privacy of uh, being with their peers. And um, the other thing is, is that, um, you know, I, I thought in my younger days, I'd like to go to medical school. I'd like be a brain mm -hmm. surgeon. I'd like to even call myself a brain surgeon, but I don't think anybody would want me to help them out or take care of that. So I think, um, and I'm not trying to make light of it, but I think that you have to uh, keep those issues separate away from the education because what I'd like to do is go into a store and have a, a high school graduate make correct change instead of being educated uh, in all these other um, things. Uh, yeah. So um, that's <laughs> oh, just my opinion, yeah. and I really appreciate you having this program. Oh, th and th I think you should have an oddsman from the state of Minnesota soda involved too oh okay especially with some of the other cultures okay thank you uh good suggestion 
Uh, yeah, I was just at a restaurant last night, and the guy said, our math in North St. Paul High School was terrible. <laughs> so he said, you better double check your stuff here. <laughs> you know? and, it, and it is bad, but uh, that's not what we're talking mm -hmm. about today. Uh, so what, what does the schools do now, or what did they do with somebody who said they were transgender? What was their current policy? It, schools, Whatever they schools decided. Schools have, yeah, they, they may have or may not have a policy. This, but, but they weren't having a, a guy shower right. in the girl's locker well, room. Well, a, a male, is a biological male, uh, up until wh however this gets implemented, it, mm -hmm. it's not going to be implemented until 2015. Mm -hmm. So it may go through some changes. We, we have to be vigilant, again, of, yeah. of that. But the way, so the way it is currently, a biological male cannot play on a female team. Mm -hmm. Under Title IX, keep in mind, females, girls can play on boys' teams if they can make the team. That's mm -hmm. part of title, the Title IX accommodation. What this does is this opens the door now and allows boys to play on girls' teams. And yeah. it's simply irrational to okay. say that a boy who feels like a girl should yeah. be treated like a girl and a boy who feels like a boy should be treated like right. a boy. Yeah. So... Uh, we're running out of time here. Okay. <laughs> it's going fast. Uh, so I want to go quickly. Sure. How they put this guideline and really made it a policy. Uh, so what, what, I, what I see in this is the way they change this whole thing is that, you know, they're poli they're, they basically put it into an appeals process, right? Correct. So if I'm transgender or think I am, mm -hmm. I can go, there's no policy spelled out, right? as to what a school is to do, but only if I make a complaint as a transgender student, then there's a then there's this policy that comes into place. Right. This this is a policy that will be imposed on schools through the appeals process. Through the appeals process. So they're telling schools, oh no, you can set up your own policy. If your policy is that a biological boy who feels like a girl, so in this case a transgender right. um student uh, is denied the ability to play on the team opposite their biological sex, then they can appeal to the Minnesota State High School League. Mm -hmm. And what this document shows is all of the criteria mm -hmm. by which the Minnesota State High School League will determine whether they are transgender. And once they determine they are transgender, number six in that policy says mm -hmm. they will be eligible to play on the opposite team. Mm -hmm. So that's not voluntary. No. That just means no. that the policy has a hammer, and the hammer comes right. through the appeals process. It's ingenious by half. I mean, this is... Of course, trickery all the way through, which leads me to a question I have. There's been, uh, I've heard there's been basically five falsehoods that have been used in selling this policy. And so can you walk through those with me? I think one is uh, 32 states, 33 states have already established this policy, which right. I've heard and I've even repeated. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but but made my qualifications to that, but I didn't have okay. the right qualifications that you have. So what's what's wrong about that statement? It's not accurate. There are not 32 states that have transgender athletic policies that say a transgender student can play on the team of the opposite biological sex. So how many are there? We counted 11. Uh, I another source that we looked at said 13. But by no means do we have do we have 32, okay. and th there is there is just no source citation for that number okay. that can be verified. Okay. We may have more to say about that down the road, but yeah. but that's well the another truth. false statement uh, that I understand to be false. Uh, somebody, uh, Mr. Roger Aronson, testified that Minnesota legislature came to him to consult with him. Uh, and said, get this resolved, uh, or basically get it passed, you know, is, is that true? That is, that's a false statement. Uh, I spoke with the, one of the legislators that spoke with him when um, he told the board at the, the Minnesota State mm -hmm. High School League that legislators said, get this resolved, um, that seemed to be a complete contradiction to what that legislator that legislator told me, mm -hmm. which was that they told him, Mr. Aronson, mm -hmm. to let the legislature handle this, to okay. drop this and let the legislature take it up. Okay, uh, and this is a big one. They're 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 saying there is a religious exemption 
to the Minnesota State High School League policy. Right. Is Let there? me explain that. It's a, it's a very misleading statement and it's serious. I mean, this is, I heard this at church. Right. There's right. an exemption. So a, a school, a private yeah. or, or re religious school, uh, can say our policy is that a transgender student will play on the team of their biological birth. Mm -hmm. However, when that team goes to play a school that may have a policy that says we allow transgender students to play on the team of their choice or the team opposite their biological gender, then that private school, when they're playing that team, has a, a choice. Mm -hmm. Their choice is to play against the team with the transgender student on mm -hmm. it, um, uh, forfeit the game, or leave the league. That's okay. not an exemption. No, that, that is, is that is just at your school. You can do what you want, but when you go to the other schools, you will abide by their policy. But this is the school you got to play against, too. I mean, when you're in these conferences That's right. and leagues. That's right. Um, okay, uh, false statement uh, that I hear may be a false statement. This is a model and voluntary policy. Even if the schools do not choose to have a policy. Uh, the Minnesota State High School League policy will be implemented through the appeal process. And the Minnesota High School League has the final say regarding yeah. eligibility. We, we talked about that a, yeah. a little bit. The, the, they say at, on their website it's a guideline. Okay. Mr. McCready said it amounts to a, a, a mandated policy, mm -hmm. but the fact is that under the through the appeals process, the Minnesota State High School League mm -hmm. can tell a school, no, you will allow that transgender student to play on the team of the opposite mm -hmm. sex, and they have the final say. And they have the final say. Well, bad time management on my part again. Uh, folks, this is a lot of serious stuff. Where do you go from here? Go to the website, um, cplaction.com, and get your information there, and dig into this. Get your churches, get your uh, other friends, let them know what's going on. And remember, uh, if you don't stand up for other people's liberties, who's going to stand up for yours? And good men don't do nothing. God bless. Have a great week. We'll see you next week. Days go 